There was a point in my life where all I did when I went fishing was go to a dam and fish with jig heads and twister tails and just cast all day. Going for white bass, smallmouth, largemouth, pike, walleye, just whatever would bite, you know, a quarter ounce, one eighth ounce jig head with a twister tail. And I did that for years, but I very rarely make jig heads. I actually just ordered a do it mold, that ultra minnow, I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's like a super detailed little jig head. I'm kind of getting back into jig fishing. So I'm gonna try in this video to make my own resin casted jig head with bird shot in the belly as weight. And this can't be a one day because I can't. I have to wait for the silicone to set and all that and that takes 12 hours, so. Two day. Here we have a half inch thick piece of hard maple. It's what I'm gonna carve the head out of. I've gotten in the habit of sitting in the house and drawing out stuff like this. So that's why I didn't draw this on camera. Like I sit in my chair and just chill out and draw stuff like this a lot now for some reason. Probably because I just had Finn or Chelsea just had Finn and uh, we've been sitting in the house watching him a lot and I just end up drawing lure stuff a lot. That's all I'm trying to say. Still don't have a glue stick. I still use this crappy spray. I haven't run out of it yet. Just waiting to run out of this stuff. Can't wait till I do. It even smears the ink. Look at this garbage. They say it's for paper, but it's got solvents in it that just like destroys ink. Maybe if you're just gluing blank sheets of paper together and you don't care if the glue seeps all the way through the paper, nobody cares about this as much as I do. So I'm gonna cut this out now. Okay, I'm gonna taper the head a little bit and just the head, I'm gonna bring the head to a, a point when you're looking at it from a bird's eye view and I'm not gonna get carried away, just a bit, tenth of an inch on each side. Bring it back to there. I could totally do fun facts right now. I just don't know what to do them about. We're making a jig head. Fun facts on jig heads. That's not fun. What is this gonna be? It's a minnow. Fun facts on minnows? Is it a minnow? I might still have fun facts in this video. I just don't know what to do yet. So let's just keep working on this. There's all the lines I'm gonna carve too. So I've gotta carve this tiny thing now with this super sharp knife. This is hard maple too. I already said that once, but wood's hard and this piece is tiny and his knife is sharp. Your thoughts and prayers are welcome. I wonder if I did cut myself close up on camera and I showed it in the video, if that would demonetize the video, like a bad cut, it probably would. Or is that considered educational? Is me cutting myself on camera educational? Getting learnt with a bait maker. Pretty good shape. I'm leaving it beefy. I want material left on here for when I carve. I wanna carve a lot of detail into this. So I'm leaving it beefy. Next step, this big seven knot jig hook needs to get set in here where it will be. I'm gonna mold this thing with the jig hook in it. That way when I mold all the other ones, I can just set the jig hook in the mold and there's a nice little cutout. It's not cut out. There's a nice little cavity for it to sit in perfectly. And then I can pour it. That went well though. This looks good so far. If there was ever a time that I cannot cut this line off center, it's now. Cause the way that this hook sits in this jig head needs to be so centered, like it's ridiculous. A tiny bit off, you're gonna be pulling your jig to the side and it's not gonna run straight. So let's get this right. 0.29259. The tough thing is that, there's, is that there's not a perfect way to get a perfect center line. Cause I already chamfered the edges. I'm just gonna stare at it for a good while. All right, I'm gonna cut it. I'm starting it with a knife. That way my saw blade is guided with that groove. Ugh. That looks extremely straight and centered. So I'm gonna cut this slot all the way down to the middle of this head. 
And as you can see, that's not nearly thick enough, so I need to uh, widen this gap. <laughs> Just trying to scoot it up from the back and push it into the position. I think that's it. That's how I want it. So I'm gonna drop some super glue in there and it'll be set. I still have to cover it with baking soda and super glue, but this will hold it in place forever. That was some accelerator and it's in there. Okay, I'm gonna have to be careful with this hook point right here. Stab myself. We don't need to turn this into a how to get a hook out of your hand video. You know what this reminds me of and what it kind of looks like is a creek chub. Fun facts on creek chubs. That's right, if what I'm making even sort of looks like something, we're gonna do fun facts on that something. This laptop's loud. I'm about to get something else out here. Bear with me, people. Creek chubs are awesome. They're just so cool. I bet these fun facts are gonna be loaded with fun. Simultilus atromacutilus. Let's look up some pronunciations because I can't read. I'm actually just getting on YouTube and looking up an extreme Philly fishing video where he caught one of these and then he'll say what the Latin name is. Of the extreme bluefish channel for years, right? The Simotulus atromaculatus. Simotulus acromaculatus. It's a small minnow. It's found in freshwater creeks in America here. Eastern US and Canada is where they're located usually. The size and color of them change up a lot depending on where you're catching them. They have a black lateral line and typically a dark brown body. So I'm definitely going to have to paint one of these jig heads in a creek chub pattern and look for a good grub that matches it, you know. Their average length is about two to six inches, but some specimens can be 12 inches. So the first part of the Latin name, Simatulus, essentially means dorsal fin. And then Atromac U Oculus is a Latin word for black spot. So for this fish, the males are usually larger than the females. The males average 125 millimeters and the females average 105 millimeters. These fish eat a lot. It says here on Wikipedia, they just eat what is directly in front of them. Um, they're very easy to catch. You go to the creek and catch them as for bait, you know, and catch them all day, every day, no matter what, usually. I used to bring a strip of bacon and just cut that up into little pieces, raw bacon with a tiny hook and just catch creek chubs as bait all the time. So before a creek chub is officially an adult, they hatch, and apparently they don't travel more than 50 meters outside of the radius from where they hatch. They always stay in a school too, when they're that young. That increases their odds of surviving, apparently. And then when the creek chub becomes an adult, uh, they travel outside of their radius, outside of that 50 meter radius. And sometimes it engages in aggressive behavior with other members of its own species. Ritualized aggression is what that is called, apparently. They have territories, you know, and then they get they invade each other's territories. They widen their fins and mouth to look big. They swim at a specific beat, like they thump their tail at a specific beat, and it's supposed to be intimidating opponent fish through these rituals. This is getting weird. The forward fish, so the fish in front of the other while they're doing that, and they're swimming parallel while they do that, stops directly below the head of the other fish, and that ensures territorial dominance over the other fish, and it forces that one to stay out of its its area. So creek chubs, they're opportunistic and they're carnivores, so omnivorous. They'll consume anything to survive. If food is getting low, they'd probably eat a rock. But they'll also eat other fish, insects, vegetation, nymphs, you, you know what I'm, the typical creek food is what they probably prefer, other than rocks. I don't know why I said rocks. Oh, so the males, they build the spawning site and then the females drawn to that spawning site that the male built from somewhere else. So just like small little pits and where there's like rocks and little pebbles and to protect the area where they're gonna spawn and lay their eggs. And then that happens. They lay about 25 to 30 eggs at a time. And then the male controls the territory because the male's the bigger fish in this case and it protects it from intruders. And then they hatch and it doesn't say how uh, maternal they are with their hatchlings. So we're gonna have to end that there. And then the Wikipedia page ran out and fun facts are over. Those weren't bad. It got kind of interesting in the middle there, but fun facts are over.
And there it is. That's the head. We got gill details, mouth details, scale details. That's gonna look good. The thing is too, I don't think you really need to seal this. I think I can just sand all this smooth where I want it to be smooth and then put it in the mold and it's gonna be just fine. The sanded surface on every casting too will be good for painting, something for the paint to grab. That's what I'm gonna do. Just sand this and I'm gonna put it in the mold. Okay, ready to mold. So I wanna pull all of this clay out right here. Pretty much don't want any clay touching the other side of this where this mesh is because it's gonna get in there and it's gonna be impossible to get out if I smush it down the clay between the scales is what I'm talking about. Then I can set that in there and then smush the clay up to it along the top and the bottom and try to get a airtight seal, silicone tight seal. So behind that doesn't just fill up with silicone, you know? Smush that in a bit, boom. That looks good so far, I need some light. So when I pour this mold, the pour spout's gonna be right here. It's gonna come all the way flush to the back of the jig head right there. And I'm gonna angle it that way. So it's gonna be pouring down into the head and all the air is gonna escape through the pour spout so there'll be no sprues. And then also when I add the, the bird shot for the weight, it's all gonna fall in this area. That's my plan. I think it'll work. I'm not really worried about it not working. Just watch, it doesn't work. Alumalite, high strength three. I get it at Hobby Lobby. I shouldn't say that because everybody's gonna buy the silicone where I get it, but this stuff works great. You can order it online too. You guys should do that. So I've found that it's completely unnecessary in a mold like this to vacuum the gas out of this silicone. It makes zero difference to the casting, even if there is a little bit of air in the silicone, unless you're like pressure casting or vacuum casting or whatever kind of, if you're just room temperature, normal pressure casting something, you don't need to evacuate the air. It makes its own little film and there won't be any air around the piece anyway. Then again, that's just my opinion. Take that however you like. I might just be lazy. Poured plenty. I kind of want this to be a thicker mold so I can pinch it together and keep that hook where it needs to be. Hopefully I'll see you at like two o'clock tonight and I'll be up for coming out here and flipping this mold over and pouring the other side, hopefully. It's the next day. So I guess this is gonna be a three day. Three day. Let's see how this half turned out though. That has never happened before. Usually the silicone comes out with the box, but in this case it did not. That's pretty clean. That's very clean, actually. That little leaving a gap in the clay left no clay on the body there. I just got some silicone seepage to clean off there. Beautiful. Just pick it off by hand. I'm gonna add some Vaseline as mold release. Just brush on a thin layer over the whole thing and pour the other half. And I'll be done today. <laughs> I really should have when it came out here last night. I fell asleep. Okie dokie, it's the next day again. Mold is done. Oh, how exciting. Let's see how we did. Nice, easy open. Applied plenty of mold release. That's a good looking mold. Right away, I wanna see how a hook fits in that slot. These jig hooks are usually made to pretty specific, you know, standards and they should all be shaped the same, should. So yeah, I mean, it closed with a little help. All the seams are flush. It should work. Let's try a different one. See, that one fits a little better. That one fits without any help at all. It goes into that groove. So maybe some hooks will be better sized than others. Oh well. 
The next thing to do will be to cut the spout that you pour the resin into here and here. I'm just gonna go like this. Well, I'm gonna make sure these are lined up perfectly and cut down a ways. Kind of tricky stuff to cut. It's so flexible and durable. I got a half ounce of bird shot and I'm just gonna do like a half ounce of resin. I pour the resin in first and then the bird shot. I wanted to clog up there just a bit, but it settled. I feel like this mold needs to be tilted a little bit. Get the lead to settle at an angle towards the nose and then just leave it like that. I think that's that'll be best. Okay, time for demold. That feels nice and heavy. Looks straight. I'm gonna cut off all this flashing and show you guys. As you can see, there is a lot of lead packed into the bottom of this body, all under the jig hook, which I think will help with stabilization. I think if I added more, it would start coming above the shank of this jig hook, which might give it some like tippy toppy. I know the line tie is still on top and that's where you're anchored to but I think this is gonna work good. You know, this is a large jig hook, but I think it's gonna have some finesse properties to it as well. There's another thing to do to this before it's ready to test. I'm gonna go test this first. I need to add a bait holder. I have to drill a hole directly under or above. I could go either way, under or above. Probably under, I want all the weight under, so probably under, eh, maybe above. You know what, let's do under. I'm gonna drill a hole directly under the shank of this jig hook and glue a little hook thing in there. Don't have to go in far. I'm bending over another little piece here. It'll be like a little hook that gets glued into the hole that I just drilled. That way it, the glue has something to grab and keep this thing in. There, that's what it'll look like. It's not glued in yet, but that's what'll hold the soft plastic on the back. So it's glued in. I'm gonna cut a grub just like that. So it's got a flat front to it and get it installed. Nice and professionally. It's a big hook. I feel like an amateur. Yeah. I just wasted this grub. Let's try that again. Also, I got bigger ones. I should try those. Okay, these are pretty much for musky. I don't know if this jig head's gonna have enough weight to support such a giant tail, but let's give this a shot first. The five inch grubs were kind of feeling too small. These are eight inch and they look better. Like that's a pretty significant dealio going on there. Let's go try this out. I'm gonna bring the other grubs too, just to make sure. It's a 1.1 ounce bait too, this whole thing, just to let you guys know. Moment of truth right here. That looked good. I think the tail being a little off-centered is pulling it in one direction. It comes in straight anyway. That's, it's stable. I'm gonna put a bright orange grub on this just so you guys can see it better. Five rings up is where I have to cut these. Yeah, I put that tail on perfectly straight and now it runs way better. Like it comes in perfectly straight too. So a half ounce of lead is enough and you just need to put these tails on perfectly and it runs perfect. I need to get back home and paint one of these and stop fishing. Okay. Let's go. We're back, this is the exact jig head that we were just testing, and I'm going to paint this in a creek chub pattern, because that's what I said I was gonna do. First, we gotta tape that hook off. You don't want to get a whole bunch of paint all over that hook. I suppose it doesn't really matter. You can just scrape it off anyway, but let's do this right. There, starting with white. Should be a quick, easy paint job, this whole thing. 
There's a big one. I like that one because you can see the chartreuse under the lateral line and you, then you can see the purple on the top too. That's what I'm going for. But the next color I'm going to do is a flesh tone as a base. And that's going to go on the top shoulder down a little bit, but it, it's not going to go into the chartreuse or the yellow that's closer to the belly there. That's where I'm going to stop with the flesh tone. Now I'm going to go for the detailed black and just make the lateral line. What the lateral line does on this fish, it starts up top by the eye and the gill plate, and then it kind of goes down to the tail and it centers itself as it goes. Definitely gonna need to mimic that. I think I'm gonna put some black on the back of this bait too while I have it in the brush. That's a good start. So next I put some gold on it and I came in really heavy from the front. And now I'm going to come from the back and put some purple the other way. I think that way when you kind of tilt it and turn it, it'll look gold from one way and purple from the other. You can see purple. You tilt it this way though and it looks more gold. Hopefully the camera sees that. Looks good. I put some of that violet color on the gills too. It's gonna get washed out a lot with all the other pearlized colors I'm gonna put on the gills, but it has a little bit in the picture, so. Last color I'm gonna do is that fluorescent yellow chartreuse bar that goes under the lateral line. It's not the lot, it's just like, I've been calling that black line the lateral line. I don't think that's actually what it's called, but the chartreuse that's under that is what we're gonna be painting now. That is all of the colors on this chub. They're really bold. I'm gonna tone them all down with like some pearl silvers and whites. Little bit of silver there, little bit of pearl white on the belly. Kind of wash it out with some pearl white, the whole thing. Make it nice and shiny. This bait's done. I'll get back to you after I'm done with that. And that's what I came up with. Kind of hard to see the colors in the phone there, but it looks similar. Looks good. I might have to go to the store and try to find some grubs that match this a little better. Last thing to do is to glue some eyes in. I'm going with this more spectrum-y, holographic, a lot less gold color. It's almost silver. Just gonna glue these in. One sec. I guess this isn't the last thing to do. I still need to clear coat. But holy crap, that really completed this lure, or this jig head. Beautiful. Since this is a jig head, I might be giving it multiple coats of this UV clear. Try to get it as durable as possible because it's going to be hitting the bottom and stuff and hitting rocks. There, that's a couple clear coats later actually. Very pretty. I'm gonna go get some grubs that match this head a little better. I'll be back. Ended up getting the perfect sized grubs. These are six inches. It's between the five inch and the eight inch ones I was using. Like this one's eight inch. This is another head I molded and I just put some black dye in it. We don't need, we don't need to be using the eight inch grub. I'm gonna toss one of these on here. That's gonna be good. They're already the perfect size too. I don't need to cut them down. Worked out great. Look at that, beautiful. I'm gonna use the more gold colored ones on the chub. And it is ready to go. Gotta clean up this clear coat off of the line tie. And yes, that's just as annoying as any other jig on this jig here. There. It's simple, but very pretty at the same time. Would have been perfect if there was some purple glitter and that soft plastic too. Would have matched it perfectly. Let's go catch a fish. First stop, it's gonna be a pond. I'm gonna leave this camera behind and just take the GoPro. Let's go. There's a raccoon being eaten by bluegills. Poor little fella. Oh. Just about ready to go to the river. This pond is pretty dead right now. I should have went to the river, but it's okay. I got more and they're easy to make. It's okay. Everything is going to be okay. I don't care that I just casted that bait off. Let's go to the river.
Dang. I lost my bait. I'm gonna go home and make more. <laughs> so we got more jigs made. I was sitting in my chair last night really thinking about what happened and I, I realized I don't even know. I don't know what happened there. I'm pretty sure a fish took it right at the beginning, like, oh, fish. And then, oh no, it's a snag. I started snapping my line, trying to get the snag out, and then all of a sudden it took it more. And I'm, oh, okay, and it's a fish, and I reeled. And then it happened again where it felt like a snag, so I pulled hard, and then the line broke. And I saw a fish. I hope it's on GoPro, I haven't seen or looked. Who cares, let's go fishing again and actually catch something, let's go. Also, oh jeez. Also, this time I'm gonna bring my bigger rod out there. It's got 50 pound test on it. And I was really trying to keep my bait up off the bottom to stop getting snags so much. So a longer rod, faster action, this should help. Here at the river, this is a spot where there's a really big sandbar in the middle of the river. And when the water's low enough, I can cross and get onto the other side. And it's good fishing over there, occasionally. It's always good to find out, you know. See if they're awake here. Just gonna keep moving and casting. Try to hit every spot. Okay, I'm on my last jig. I need to sharpen it. Uh-oh. Well, that's not good. Well, I've made and I've snagged five jigs and I have none left with me. So I'm tying a little crank on and I'm gonna try to catch something. Oh, I just remembered. I hope I have them with me. Oh, good. These are some jig heads that a subscriber sent to me. He made these and painted them and everything. So this is the next best thing, catching fish with subscriber lures instead of mine. So if I catch a fish with this, it's still a success. Just gonna toss a Kalins on here and we're back in business. This is the last spot I'm going to try with jigs to catch something. If I don't catch anything here, I will not have caught anything for this video. Pressure's on. Oh, shoot. Okay, I just set that into a log really hard. Well, I'm probably not getting this back. Well, there went all of my jigs. I think I'm gonna fish with other stuff just to see if they'll actually bite other stuff. Like I think the fishing has just become atrocious. Like they won't even bite a jig. If I get a fish with this, I'm never gonna fish with a jig in my life again, ever. Oh. Okay, let's try to get one on the little crappie crank, I guess. I'll just keep going until I run out of battery. Oh! Right at the bank. A bass.
Well, looks like I'm never gonna fish with a jig again. <laughs> Crankbaits for the win. I don't know what to say. I'm no longer getting back into jig fishing. That was pathetic. Could be that the fish just are not biting. There's no reason for them to. Uh, the weather's not ideal. The, the waters are, you know, just low. I don't know. There's some lessons to learn from all of this. Only fish with lures that you make, and they're ha they have to be fancy and, you know, wooden hard body baits are, are ideal. That's the only thing that catches fish. I'm not giving up on jigs. I just am completely demoralized by... I spent like three days fishing with those jigs and then fishing with a subscriber's jigs that he sent me and I caught nothing for three days. That's weird. It must just be a bad time for fishing. But I did catch a fish on a crankbait. So I'm gonna think of something fancy to make for the next video. I need to step it up. Like a fan really fancy ultralight kind of thing. That'd be good. Something small that'll catch fish. That's really fancy though. Good boy. Yep, that's it. Video's over. On to the next bait.